cool. Um, hey everyone, Jack Carney. I'm uh, an infrastructure engineer at Coinbase. I've been at Coinbase for like two years now um, and been on Infra the whole time. Um, so if you're not familiar, Coinbase is um, basically a brokerage to buy and sell different digital assets. So currently we support Bitcoin, Bitcoin Cash, Ethereum, and Litecoin. Um, if you're unfamiliar with digital assets, they're um, immutable assets that um, essentially if you control the private key to an address, you control the, the funds. So any compromise of our environment is basically business ending. We, so we need to take security incredibly seriously. Um, so yeah, so before di di diving into like blockchain nodes and, and kind of like what fanciness we're doing around that, I want to talk about kind of what um, how the, the infrastructure at Coinbase is structured because of these security requirements. So there's really like two primary um, concerns that we have and sort of guiding principles to our overall infrastructure. Um, and that is um, everything is both immutable and ephemeral. So what I mean by immutable is that um, any configuration change, any environment variable change, anything like that requires redeploy of 99% of our services. Um, this ensures that um, every configuration change is tracked in source control of some kind, um, and also ensures that we're always in a deployable state. So we can't get into some like really funky state where somebody hacked on something and didn't really know how, how they're gonna like roll back. We always can like prove how we got there, and we can also like prove how we can redeploy a service. Um, ephemeral means that every server in our infrastructure is under 30 days old. Um, this is a really, really challenging problem and means that we have to make all our services, um, it, it essentially means that we need to like handle state on all of our services in, in an interesting way. Um, it's a huge benefit for security because um, first of all, we're like every time we roll a service, we're, we're pulling in all patches that have, have come out since then. Um, we're also ensuring that if anyone were to ever gain a foothold in, our, in any of our environments, we're gonna force them to constantly have to re-exploit um, the same vulnerability. We have like quite a lot of monitoring and alerting on any anomalous activity on in our infrastructure. So if we're forcing someone to exploit the same vulnerability over and over, this would probably be something we'd eventually pick up. Um, so it's like a huge security win for us. Um, so Codeflow is this homegrown tool that we've built that sort of uh, enables both of these principles. So it's at its core, it's just a configuration and secret storage system that does full blue-green deploys for us. So um, it's just like a user interface that every developer within Coinbase has access to, and it lets you just select a commit, deploy a commit, very simple. It's like a pretty easy to use tool, um, but it, th the point is that it does 12-factor app deployments really well. So it's you can kind of think of it as like a Heroku for Coinbase. This is like a little screenshot of it. Um, so one thing that's really critical about Codeflow is that um, we never want folks to be afraid or scared to click this button. Like we want, if if Codeflow says you can deploy it, you should be able to deploy it, and you should be able to deploy that button, or you can you should be able to click that button as many times as you want. So we're I we always want to encourage developers to deploy like as many times as as they feel comfortable deploying. Um, and so in our environment, deploying. Through Codeflow looks like this. It's really easy, it's seamless, the clouds are pretty, the cloud is a great place to be. Um, there's still a few services in our environment that aren't deployed with Codeflow. And in those, in those situations, it's a very manual process, it's error prone, it's bad, the cloud is a scary place. Um, okay, so back to blockchain nodes. So what are blockchain nodes? Fancy, fancy graph. <laughs> um, so blockchain nodes are uh, blockchains are basically peer-to-peer -peer networks. So the nodes are just peers in these peer-to-peer -peer networks. They need to agree on the state of the network at any given time. Um, they need to process incoming transactions, um, validate that those incoming transactions are actually valid, and then propagate them to the, to the rest of the network. So because we're uh, basically a client of this network, we have to like participate in in this um, process. So at the edge of our infrastructure, we have a whole series of, of what we call edge nodes. So they sit kind of out in the periphery and um, just report back to us like the state of the blockchain at any time. Um, as I alluded to earlier though, state management in Codeflow is really hard. Codeflow is great at deploying 12-factor apps, but it's not great at deploying stateful services. We use, um, for, for the most part, we use like managed data stores, things like RDS when we have state. 
And anytime we actually have to bring state into the box, it becomes really, really tricky. And blockchain nodes are, are beefy, beefy um, in, in their disk usage. They're like, you can see this is a screenshot I took from one of our Geth nodes. Geth is an um, Ethereum implementation. Um, and it has 952 gigs on disk, which is like not, not a small amount of data, especially if you're trying to like rapidly redeploy this. Um, so we had to figure out how we we're going to do something creative with this. Um, another, another thing that made this tricky is that node management overall gets really, really complicated for us. There's tons of different protocols we're trying to support. Um, currently, like I mentioned in the beginning, Ethereum, Bitcoin, Bitcoin Cash, and Litecoin, but hopefully there'll be more to come soon. Um, each one of these has different versions. Um, each one of these has multiple chains. So there's like multiple versions of test nets for each um, for each like protocol, you can have like different sort of like levels of stability of, of chains, and then also we have many different business units at this point. So we have like the the Coinbase.com, the brokerage I, I mentioned, but there's a, a, s a series of other businesses that all need to talk to the blockchain. So when you multiply all these things together, there's quite a lot of nodes that we need to manage, and it becomes like a pretty challenging um, problem to keep these under 30 days old. Also, another thing that complicates this, if you know. Um, uh, anything about nodes, a lot of people who are like using nodes on their desktop will prune the nodes and they'll and they'll run like not fully verified nodes. So it's it hasn't actually verified the whole blockchain all the way back. That's not a that's not something like a concession we're willing to make. So all these nodes are gonna be fully verified. Cool. So how did we actually solve this? So we wrote this tool called Snapchain. And what Snapchain does is basically let us blue green deploy blockchain nodes using EBS volumes to handle the state. In, in a kind of clever way. So um, essentially there's two different kinds of Snapchain servers. There's a snapshot server and then a long-lived server. The snapshot server, in short, is the server that's actually taking snapshots of the blockchain and like constantly checkpointing it. And then the long-lived servers are um, the servers that are like clients of uh, like applications that we use in the back end. So the long-lived ones last forever, and the snapshots are like constantly kind of getting shut down and spun up to, to um, take an, a little literal snapshot of the blockchain. Cool. So diving into the snapshots a little bit. This is this is a, um, some code that's actually in Snapchain. So the box comes up, and we just put it into a loop where we say, "Hey, start the this blockchain node. Wait until it syncs and is fu fully healthy. Stop. Flush everything to disk. Then take a snapshot of this." and then repeat that process. So the node's actually coming up, getting fully in sync, then stopping, and then taking a snapshot. And it just does this on repeat. So visually, say we have a parity. Parity's another um, Ethereum implementation. Parity version 196 running on one of the test nets, Robston. Um, it's gonna come up, we're gonna, cr we're gonna create a new volume. And this is like, while, th while the box is actually running, we're gonna create a new volume we're going to attach it. We're going to wait until it's fully attached. Then we're going to create a create a file system on it, and then and then proceed. So we grab this visually again. We take the EBS volume. We match it on there, and then just every hour on the on the dot, it's going to take a snapshot. Boom, boom, boom. Cool. So then the other side of this is the long-lived servers, the things that we actually want to um, are are like application boxes to talk to. So the way this works is. Parity 196 again spins up. It says, what's the, what's the most recent snapshot? It's the most recent one was at 3 p.m. It's then going to, this is, this is a little detailed, but it's then going to like restore that snapshot into a volume, mount it on itself, and then away it runs. Here's an NLB. Um, we like to run NLBs in front of these because NLB does uh, TCP connections a lot better than ELBs. It's like Amazon's new um, fancy lower level uh, load balancer. And then any client can just peer to this. The NLB sta uh, stands in the way and we can actually do blue-green deploys, which is CodeFlow's kind of bread and butter behind this NLB of this really staple service. Cool, so what do we actually get out of this? One thing that's really, really cool about EBS volumes is that snapshots take a pretty long time, but restoring them is, is actually incredibly quick. So you can have like a three gigabyte, uh, three hundred gigabyte snapshot, and restoring it to a volume that you can actually read from takes, you know, on the order of um, several minutes. It's it's really really quick, um, 
And then version upgrades here are really slick, and we have like very clean rollback processes for it. So to the speed element, um, this is from this is a screenshot from Codeflow I took a few weeks ago. This is me deploying what was then the current version of Bitcoin D um, in 12 minutes. So this is like you know hundreds and hundreds of gigabytes, and and it's deploying this whole thing from scratch in 12 minutes. Cool. So this is again this is a visualization of what a version upgrade would look like. Um, so we have parity 1.10 uh, on Ropsine. Previously, we were looking at parity 1.96 on Ropsine. So say we have um, a couple different snapshots to choose from. We have the 1.95, the 1.96, and we have this other uh, 1.10 beta. So how do you actually choose which snapshot you want to roll onto? So this is where AWS tags are just amazing and super, super powerful. So we've in the process of taking these snapshots, we've done a really good job of tagging everything and saying, well, what protocol is this? What chain is this? What version is this running on? What was the state of this database when we took the snapshot? So in this case, we decide that we want to base this snapshot off, or this uh, Parity 1.0 upgrade off the Parity 1.9.6 uh, snapshot. And so we select that using a query um, like language we built into Snapchain. And away we go. The same process continues. It turns the snapshot into a volume, mounts it, migrates the DB, and then runs. So as I, as I mentioned earlier, the, the deploy process here is really, really um, simple and, and nice because we don't actually have to, because NLBs give us like static IPs, it becomes a really seamless process to deploy these. So here we've got an NLB sitting in front of three different parity nodes. Um, this is a client application that's talking through the NLB to these parity nodes. Um, and then we want to just spin up a whole new set. So we put, we grab three more, and then away, and then we tear down the, the previous blue nodes. And the client application never actually sees, or it just acts, it just behaves like totally normally. It's, it's um, since these, peer, these are peer-to-peer -peer networks, so we're, we're really used to like, you know, connections dropping and stuff, so that all the client applications I've worked with are just, handle this seamlessly. It's, it's been really awesome. Um, another really important thing about this is there's nothing blockchain specific to this, or there's nothing specific about a single blockchain in this deployment process. Um, it's just we want to manage some amount of state. We want that state to be in an EBS volume, and we want to know how we turn off a node so that it winds up in a good state. And this is super, super important because um, the number of blockchains that are this that are actually like out there is, is increasing quite significantly over the past few years. So this is a screenshot I took um, that shows the number of projects on GitHub that are like some sort of blockchain. And then I think more importantly, this is um, a shot from Coin Market Cap, which is kind of like this all-encompassing um, website that that looks at like the whole ecosystem. There's 1,600. Uh, cryptocurrencies that CoinMarketCap is tracking. That's a lot. Coinbase currently supports four. Not that we're going to get to 1,600, but you know we, we want to add a lot more. So building tooling that is blockchain agnostic is becoming an increasingly important part of, of our job. And also, this, this slide is really important because it tells you what to do with your cryptocurrency, which is hold it. Um, cool. So the <laughs> during the course of, of developing this, um, this project, I, uh, I ended up taking down our like dev deploys <laughs> like uh, several times because I was just uh, exceeding the capacity of EBS volumes that Amazon was <laughs> letting us use. Uh, so we had to like think about an actual strategy for like how we're going to clean this up. So it's just a pretty simple Lambda function. Um, I like the retention policy a lot. It just says keep everything for three days and then after that just keep one date chain protocol tuple per day. And then after 50 days, we don't care, just drop ev everything. Um, and this is be nice because the blockchain kind of at its core is an append-only data store. So we don't anything that gets more than 50 days old, we're, we're fine. We still have that state. It's just a newer version of that. Cool. So this is the future. What are we, what are we going? Where are we going from here? Um, I'd like to open source all of this. I'd like, to, um, I'd like to, to be able to just open source and have people use this for like arbitrary other nodes and and hopefully if people want to build integrations for like other blockchains you know they could they could go for it 
Another really cool thing is Amazon offers functionality to let you publicly share a lot of different resources, including EBS volumes. So I'd really like to uh, deploy this into a custom AWS account that's really locked down um, and not used for anything else in Coinbase, and then actually share the snapshots from there. So anyone else could s spin up um, their own node server on like a T2 medium or something very, very quickly. Another big aspect to this is going to be actually building a uh, user interface for the node management because it's getting pretty cumbersome within Codeflow. So we're going to actually want to have some way of um, just a really like friendly UI to select a node you want to use um, and spin up spin up new ones. Just make it like all the all the more easier for our developers to um, run away with this like self um, run away with this the infrastructure here. Cool. So we're hiring. Uh, if anybody wants to talk to me about what we're working on or, or has any interest, please come talk to me. And um, if you want to reach out to me, my email is jack at coinbase.com. <laughs> if anyone has questions or whatever, I'd, I'd love to, to take them. Yeah, that's it's pretty team by team. Um, I think we're all roughly agile, um, but I think that we sort of have like empowered the individual teams to like structure themselves sort of how they see fit. Um, my team specifically follows like a you know two week sprint cadence, and we're deploying um, our main services. We're deploying say ten times a day, so very very rapidly. Yeah, so I mean, every time a new server st stands up, it's it's standing up an entirely new volume. So those are basically following the same uh, same schedule as the servers as the EC2 instances. Yeah, in some circumstances, in this case, we don't because um, because the blockchain is again append only. So we we really don't need to like retain it for all that long. We we just need to retain it for as long as we. Like until we feel comfortable that we've successfully rolled off a version and never want to roll back to that version, um, we won't destroy it. But as soon as we feel like, yeah, we're never going to go back to parity, you know, one seven one or something, then then we'll feel comfortable like tearing down those EBS volumes. Oh yeah, yeah. Sorry, can you can you repeat it again? I yeah, yeah. I you like within Coinbase? Yeah. So I think a big problem that we're starting to face is that um, different business units they all need to integrate with the blockchain and those those integrations are all really, really difficult. Um, and so I think a big challenge over the next year or two is going to be how do we abstract that and make interfaces that any arbitrary business unit can, can tap into and that follows really good conventions around how to integrate with that blockchain, um, avoids any pitfalls that, that you might encounter if you're trying to integrate with a blockchain, and really just forces the expertise of of a specific blockchain like down down a layer so that application developers don't necessarily have to like worry about that and they just see this this interface as as a, as a basically a tool as an API to like build an application on top of um, that's that's I think the f the future of of this I would say is like the first building block in that kind of vision but um, but yeah it's it's quite a long ways away from where we are now Cool. All right. Thanks, everyone.